So then she would go out with these guys who were amazing guys. And then she'd be like, yeah, he's amazing. But like, I don't know. I just didn't feel the spark. I didn't feel the chemistry because you haven't worked through that other stuff. So you don't feel comfortable. You actually get anxious around people who are good for you. People who are good for you, you either get numb, you feel nothing or you get anxious, right? Or you get repulsed. Okay. It's one of those things happens. Um, and so it's really important to understand why do you, if you find this pattern, it's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. So if you, if every guy you're dating is, is like, you know, a jerk or is disappointing to you or is unreliable, maybe it's you, meaning maybe you are choosing people like that. And then what people say is, oh, men are terrible. They're all awful. It's like you're choosing people and you're, you're we call this repetition compulsion. You're, you're repeating something from childhood over and over to try to master a situation that you will always lose at. Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Hafiz, and I hope you guys are having a great day today. We are back for another episode, guys, and this guest is someone that I'm really excited about bringing to you. She wrote a book that I saw. Um, is a, a older book, but when I read it for the first time, I thought that the wisdom, the insight was amazing, that this is such an interesting conversation. I think you guys will really learn a lot from it, as well as you guys can really, I advise you to get this book and other books that this author has. So please, without further ado, do welcome to the show the one and only Lori Gottlieb hi good to be here hey how's it going Lori good how you doing I'm doing great I'm doing great uh I get you I got your last name right yep you did uh, that's awesome that's awesome so Lori for the people who don't know who you are can you give a bit of an elevator synopsis about who you are what you do and all that good stuff yeah um I am a therapist um I'm the author of the book maybe you should talk to someone which we're making into a tv show right now I have a podcast called dear therapists where you can hear actual sessions with people coming on with everyday problems and we give them advice and then they have to try out our advice. They have a week to do it and come back and tell us how it went. Um, and I have a TED talk out there called um, How Changing Your Story Can Change Your Life. That's awesome. So how long have you been a therapist for? Oh, uh, gosh, um, maybe like uh, 10, 12, 13 years, something like that. Oh, wow. <laughs> what made you decide to do that? So I, I was a journalist and I was writing basically other people's stories and I was fascinated by stories and the human condition. And I decided that I really wanted to kind of help people edit their stories. I realized that a lot of people get stuck because they're stuck in this faulty narrative, like I'm unlovable or nothing will ever work out for me or I can't do that or whatever their story is. And I felt like I wanted to help people to get unstuck. And I was fascinated by um, the idea of doing that from, you know, instead of reporting people's stories to help people to change their stories. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. So what I want to talk to you about, I know it's been a minute since you wrote this book, but I want to talk to you about, you know, this book, Marry Him, The Case for Selling for Mr. Good Enough. I mean, this book is something that I I was I was talking about so many of the different topics and conversations in this book. And literally when I read it, I was like, it's literally like all the research that I was doing was all put into one place. So for the people who are not familiar with it, what made you decide to write this book? Yeah. So first of all, I, the, the subtitle is so misleading. I never advocate for settling. So that that was something that the publisher did. Um, so it's not about settling at all. That came from a conversation where men and women were asked, you know, like, what do you consider settling to be? And, um, you know, women were basically, it, so they asked like men and women, even like, what would you need to go on a second date with somebody? And men said they needed three things to go on a second date with someone. She had to be interesting to talk to. She had to be cute, but not like, not like gorgeous movie star cute, right? Like just like cute to him, right? And, um, and she had to be nice. Like she had to be like a kind, nice person. Like, you know, we know those people when you're at a restaurant and they're being like really rude to the waiters and stuff, not somebody like that. And so, so, um, so, you know, that was what, that was what men said. They needed just three things to go on a second date with someone. Women named 300 things 
<laughs> that they would I mean there was this list that was exhaustive it was like can't be this can't be that has to be this has to be that and so it was this question of like what does that really mean right like how are we choosing partners and are we looking for the wrong qualities are we looking for the qualities that don't matter and are we not looking hard enough at the qualities that do matter things like kindness emotional generosity do you have shared values do you enjoy just being with the person right like regardless of all these other things that we're taught especially as women to look for in a partner that actually don't when we look at so my book is a, it's a reported book it's partly a memoir of, of my journey going through this but it's also a reported book that I wrote as a journalist. And so all the studies and data show these are the things that matter in happy, lasting marriages. And these are the things that don't matter at all, but that people place such a high value on when they're dating. No, that makes perfect sense. And one of the things I really loved about this book was that you were able to be so introspective and so radically honest about your life, your situation, and exactly what you're going through. I find that for a lot of people, like that level of introspection and that level of radical candor is something that's extremely uncomfortable for them. So as a therapist, and as you've been obviously seeing lots of different clients, do you find it very difficult for men and women to be that radically honest about about their lives and their struggles the way you were in this book? I do. I mean, I think that people come in and they, they want something to change because it's not working, whatever's going on. But usually what they want is some someone else or something out there to change, right? They don't want to look inside and say, what is my role in this? Like, what am I doing that I could do differently? Because whatever I'm doing right now isn't working. And often people don't realize that maybe they are um, you know, doing something in terms of their selection process that is getting in their way of finding the person that they will actually fall in love with. So the book isn't about having you be with someone that you're not truly, completely, 100% in love with. It's about what's getting in the way of you finding that person. No, 100%. And I think that's the part that I like a lot because similar to what you said, if you, if you, obviously I've written before, so I know how publishers get when they try to, you know, craft something to, to, to draw an emotional response to the, the reader to be able to get them to make a, a purchase. But in regards to your book, you know, the general premise when people think about settling, the idea is that settling means that you're getting what will make you unhappy, right? Right. So if I have to settle for this home, generally speaking, it's a home that I did not want. If I have to settle for this job, it's generally speaking, I have to settle for this job that I did not want. But that's not what you're communicating in this book. One of the things that I love that you communicate is that you're asking these individuals to be radically honest about who they are and specifically what do they need to be happy. Because this book is about finding a person that can make you happy. But the, but the problem is for so many people, the things that really will make them happy are not the things that they're prioritizing in a relationship. So from your experience, what are some of the things that you've noticed, not only from your research from your book, but also from your clients that women are prioritizing in a relationship that in the long run won't be making them happy? Right. Well, I think, you know, there's this thing that I talk about in the book, the difference between satisficers and maximizers. And this is a study. This isn't my opinion this is actually research that was done and they found that people who are maximizers are people who have to have the very best of everything and they're never satisfied and people who are satisfied spicers know what they want their 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 bar is high they have like you know they they have high criteria but when they find something that meets those criteria they're happy with it they're satisfied with it so an example is let's say you want to buy a sweater and um, and you go into a store and you find a sweater and it and and you love it and it fits well and you go out and you get lots of compliments on it and you're very happy with it that's great. You're a satisficer. You found what you want. A maximizer will probably look at that sweater, not buy it and say, but let me just go to a few other stores and see if I can find something better. Maybe there's something mm, else yeah. that's a better price or a better style or a better this, or they buy the sweater. And then the next day they're like walking through the mall and they're like, oh, look at that sweater that I just saw in the window. Maybe that one's better. And then they don't like the one they have. So maximizers are never happy. They're always like, they have to maximize and maximize and maximize. Whereas satisficers find what they want and they appreciate it and they're happy. And I think that that no, happens that in dating. Sense. The same thing happens in dating, right? Where people, they, they feel like, you know, especially with apps, like the way that people date nowadays, right? So on an app, you go on a first date with somebody, you're like, I had a really good time. That was pretty fun. Um, but I didn't feel like amazing butterflies. 
yet, right? But it was really fun. I really liked the person. I would totally see them again. Then you're like driving home or you're coming home and you're like, oh, look at all these notifications on the app. Maybe that person is better. And so you never get to know somebody because you're juggling so many different people trying to maximize something and you can't really treat human beings like a shopping experiment. Guys, we're gonna take a quick pause from this amazing interview with Lori to talk about our exceptional sponsors at BetterHelp. BetterHelp is one of the largest online counseling platforms in the world, and they are our paid sponsors who are here to help you guys become the best version of yourself emotionally. As you guys can see from this episode, one of the most important things that we're talking about is the importance of dealing with your inner issues, dealing with your inner wounds, and counseling and therapy is so exceptional, and BetterHelp gives you guys licensed professional counseling from the comfort of your own home. Yes, guys, that means that you don't have to worry about any uncomfortable stays in a waiting room, and if you guys want to change counselors, you can be able to change counselors free of charge. Guys, I cannot express how important taking care of your mental health is for every single person here in the roommates community. Go ahead and sign up on betterhelp.com slash roommates and you'll be able to get 10% off your free month. Please guys, take your mental health seriously. If you're somebody who's going in consistent ruts and going in consistent cycles and you're not seeing progression, take advantage of BetterHelp. Take advantage of whatever resources possible and we want to see you guys win, be successful and flourish so without further ado let's get back to the interview no i love i absolutely love that point because i think it's something that um what was the name of the book that you quoted in the in your book it was oh, the, the uh, paradox of choice paradox of choice yes, exactly Barry I mean, Schwartz's something that book. happens all throughout society it's not just in day like you said in, on all these things whether it's going to the store whether it's buying a car you know all these choices and options makes us desire you know things that are you know the next best thing. And something else you talked about in the book that I found really interesting was so many people, especially young women, when, when you ask them questions about, you know, what, after going on a date, uh, why did you not give this guy a second date or why were you not interested in continuing? A lot of individuals will be like, oh, there wasn't, there wasn't any sparks. Yes. There wasn't any butterflies. And one of the things you talked about in the book is that what you found out for a lot of people is that sometimes the sparks or the butterflies or that feeling of being in love usually comes from, you know, things like trauma bonds, where if you might be used to someone being inconsistent, you might be used to somebody who's overly, you know, flirtatious or things like that. And that becomes this spark. So when you meet an individual or a man who's more stable, who's more consistent, who's more responsive, because you don't have those excitements and those, you know, adrenaline rushes, you now think that that means that there's no spark in this situation. Right, there's a woman actually in my new book, um, maybe you should talk to someone just like that. She's in her early 20s and she keeps dating these guys and they never work out for her. And at one point she starts even dating someone that she hooks up with in the waiting room. I don't mean they hook up in the waiting room. <laughs> Our office is not that exciting, but um, but they meet in the waiting room. And, and I know that he's gonna be bad news because everyone she chooses is bad news. And so why is that? It's because you're on, if you haven't worked through whatever, like however, you were disappointed in childhood, right? If you haven't worked through that, then you choose people who are similar to that, even though you think you're choosing the opposite. So it's kind of like you you, you see a guy and your unconscious says, oh, you look familiar, come closer, right? And, and he might not be exactly like the parent who disappointed you or whatever you didn't get as a child, but once you get to know him, he is. And that's why you are drawn to those people. So then she would go out with these guys who were amazing guys. And then she'd be like, yeah, he's amazing, but like, I don't know. I just didn't feel the spark. I didn't feel the chemistry because you haven't worked through that other stuff. So you don't feel comfortable. You actually get anxious around people who are good for you. People who are good for you, you either get numb, you feel nothing, or you get anxious, right? Or you get repulsed. Okay. It's one of those things happens. Um, and so it's really important to understand why do you, if you find this pattern, it's kind of like if a fight breaks out in every bar you're going to, maybe it's you. So if you, if every guy you're dating is, is like, you know, a jerk or is disappointing to you or is unreliable, maybe it's you, meaning maybe you are choosing people like that. And then what people say is, oh, men are terrible. They're all awful. It's like you're choosing people and you're, you're we call this repetition compulsion. You're, you're repeating something from childhood over and over to try to master a situation that you will always lose at. 
And so that's really important is to understand the psychology of what you're doing as well. And, and actually, when you talk about butterflies, there's a study in the book that I cite that they did the study of people who had been married for 20 years and they followed them not with memory, but at the time they followed them every few years they interviewed them. So after the first date, um, you know, after the first year, after the first, you know, every year, or I think it was maybe every five years they followed up and they asked them about their, their relationships and the people who were happily married at 20 years, when you ask them about their first date later, they would say, oh yeah, we, we had like instant chemistry, right? But if you went back to 20 years ago when they reported at the time, they said like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of nice. Maybe I'll go on another date. Like there wasn't instant chemistry, but because they're happy now, they remember it differently. The people who were unhappy would say like, oh yeah, I never really, I never really liked him in the first place. But at the time they reported, oh my God, I have amazing sparks with this person. So we change based on how we see the relationship now, our memory of it changes. So it's really important for people to know that many people who are madly in love with their partners and very happy with them um, did not immediately have that amazing butterfly sensation that the movies tell us we're supposed to have. And that that came later. It came in a process of really getting to know the person, of understanding you know, who we are, who they are, and, and forming those connections. It, it doesn't always happen immediately. Sometimes that, that yep. chemistry is a sign that you are being attracted to something that is dangerous for you. Mm, no, that's great. And one of the things I also liked about the book at the very end was just just you being radically honest about, you know, this isn't a dating book. This is I, this is my you me sharing my story, which makes perfect sense of why that you've been successful in your counseling field. And one of the things that you say is that like this is a warning and for, for for young ladies about this is where the mistakes I've made. Right. And because I've made these mistakes, you know, these are things that I'm having to now deal with. And my and your hope through that book is that women will be able to learn from your story and learn from your experience so that they won't be able to make the same mistake. But one of the things I also noticed was that earlier on in the book, when you were in this, um, the, the meeting with all the younger women and you were sharing some of these ideas, the young women were not receptive to some of the things that you were saying. So my question is post, you know, writing the book and then during your current counseling sessions, when you talk to young women about these things, about the unrealistic expectations, about prioritizing the wrong things, about, you know, not giving the right guy the opportunities, what has been the receptiveness from these women and what has been the pushback? Has it been more receptive? Has it been more pushback? What has your experience been like? Well, when the, the book first came out, I mean, it became a New York Times bestseller and a lot of people were reading it, but I think that the people who were reading it were feeling like, I wish I had this book when I was in my 20s. And the people in their 20s refused to read it. Now, partly because it has that horrible title, which again, does not represent what's in the book. Um, so I don't blame them. Um, but I think that a lot of people were trying to get other people to read it. And they would say like, ignore the title, read this book. It's, it's a heavily researched book about what actually matters in happy relationships. And it's not asking people to lower their expectations. It's the opposite. It's actually asking people to have higher expectations about the things that actually matter. So a lot of times people will say like, oh, this guy is so amazing and I love all these things about him, but I don't understand why he doesn't call me when he says he will, or I don't know what happened to him, or he kind of disappeared and then he and then he came back and he was so loving and it's so confusing to me. Well, you don't have high enough expectations around reliability and communication. Mm. Okay. So a lot of people, they put a lot of priority on things that are not going to make them happy. Like, do you really want to be married and live your life every day with someone where you always feel on edge, where you never know where you stand, where some days they're incredibly, you know, um, loving toward you and very, very attentive and present. And other days they're kind of like, you're, you're kind of like wondering if they're going to break up with you. Most people don't want to go through life like that. So people don't realize that they're not having high enough standards around things like reliability, communication, emotional maturity. I mean, do you want to do you want to be with someone who's not emotionally mature? Um, you know, how do you guys, what happens when you guys have disagreements? How do you get through them? What happens with rupture? We call rupture and repair, right? You have a rupture. Everybody has disagreements. How do you repair it? Do you have a lot of drama in your relationship? Do you want to live with a lot of drama for the rest of your life? Because it will probably lead to toxic stress in your life. 
Um, and if you have children, it will be terrible for your children to live in that environment. So I think that people in their 20s are kind of, you know, sold this bill of goods around like, what does it mean to find a partner through media, through cultural programming, whatever we've been told. And they're not told, nobody gives them real instruction, which is what my book is on what is actually going to be a fulfilling relationship for you and how will you find the person that you are truly in love with and who truly loves you. And that's the kind of love that I think we all want. And so when you ask about reception, I think that, um, you know, women in their 20s are reading the book, but they're embarrassed to say they're reading the book now. They weren't at first. Now they are. But what I get, I get every week still, and this book came out like over a decade ago, what I still get every week are letters from people who have read the book who say like, I've been married five years now and I never would have been married to this person if I hadn't read your book and I never told my friends I read your book. And now I'm trying to give it to all my friends who are still single and they're like 40 now and you know, whatever it is. And there's nothing, and I'm not trying to scare women at all. So this isn't like some kind of retro anti-feminist book. It's quite the opposite. It's like, I want women to take control of their love lives. I want to empower women so that they aren't sitting there going, I am so unhappy and I am so lonely. I want them to be yeah. able to find the love that they deserve. 100%. And, and that's why I think everything makes perfect sense about what happened to you after writing the book um, in regards to you getting into counseling, moving from journalism counseling to you writing, you know, this another best selling book as well, which is going to be turned into a television show as well. So I think what happened, it was by you being able to be so introspective, to be able to be so radically honest. And, and you did a lot of internal work. I mean, a shout out to Evan for all the work that <laughs> you guys did together. That's right. But you, but, but you guys did a lot of work and in all in all honesty, Honestly, I hope no one's offended by it, especially at being older. And and because and, a lot of times, whether you're male or female, the older you get, the more set in the ways you become. So for you to be at that age, to be able to do the work, to be able to really be introspective and to be able to analyze these deep things about your life, and then for you to be able to begin to apply these things and then to be able to help other people, I think it's extremely powerful and extremely magical. And this is why I... I mean, you probably are a huge ad advocate for it as well, that therapy and counseling is so important, which is why Letters to My Counselor is such a great uh, um, a read, because these are things that a lot of people need to be able to do by being able to sit down with somebody and process what the heck is leading me to make the same mistakes I'm making over and over again. Right. And you see that again in, in my current book. Maybe you should talk to someone. You can see people go through that in, in you know, real life situations. Um, and I feel like therapy is like getting a really good second opinion on your life from someone who's not already in your life. And in, maybe you should talk to someone. I talk about the difference between idiot compassion and wise compassion. So idiot compassion yeah. is is what we do with our friends. And this is this is you know what I talk about. Out in in both books actually but um, but I, I actually shout it out particularly in maybe you should talk to someone because I think it's so important when our friends come to us and they say look what this guy did or look what this person did or whatever it is and I'm not just saying women by the way anybody okay like 100%. you know um, we tend to say to our friends yeah you're right they were wrong that's terrible right we just like stick with our friends our buddies right because it's like it's like we want to support them but the thing is there's something often going on. Like sometimes the other person is a jerk, right? We have this saying in therapy before diagnosing someone with depression, make sure they aren't surrounded by assholes, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so, so it's like, yeah, there are like, there are people out there who are jerks, but, but if you find that your friend is always sort of like coming up against or complaining about everybody in their life, or they're complaining about all the people that they date, um, you know, at a certain point, you, you're agreeing with them is not helping. It's not like, yeah, you're right, right? It's like, maybe you shouldn't be going through his text, you know? <laughs> maybe you, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, and, or maybe you're just, you know, going after these guys or these women, if depending on, you know, who you are, um, who are just not the right people for you. And, and I think that what you get in therapy is you get wise compassion instead of idiot compassion. And wise compassion is where we hold up a mirror to you and we help you to see something about yourself that maybe you haven't been willing or able to see. And that's where mm. the growth and transformation come from. That's where the change happens. That's where you can say, I'm going to have agency over my life. Now, it's not just going to be, look, all these things are happening to me and it's so frustrating, but I actually have a role in this and I have choices about what I do and I can do things differently and I can get a different result.
100%. No, I, you said that beautifully. I mean, I think that's one of the biggest differences that um, I feel like we're struggling with in society is that so many people, when they have issues and they have problems, whether it's dating, whether it's business, whether it's finance, no matter where it is, they look for people to vent to. Yes. And venting is okay. And there is a place for venting in healing and, and counseling and in therapy. But the problem with venting is that a lot of times venting does not allow you to have tangible solutions. And so end of the day, if you're just venting to somebody like, oh, yeah, they're always blaming the other person. But to be able to have an individual like you, an amazing counselor, to be able to speak their mind to and then be able to get tangible solutions to be able to improve themselves so they can take accountability for their growth and well-being. I think it's extremely magical. I think it's extremely powerful. And it's something that every single individual can do. We do that. So, Lori, oh, I was just going to say we do that in our. So I have a podcast called Dear Therapists and where you can hear an actual session with somebody every week and. Um, you know, we have, uh, we, we just launched season two, but in, in, we have someone in season two, she keeps dating the same kind of guy over and over and over. And, and we are, you know, and she, and she doesn't understand sort of what her own role in this is. And so you can see in the podcast, how we help people, even one session can significantly change someone's perspective. They can really shift their perspective in terms of what they do. And in, in season one, um, we had several cases like that where so many things with like guys, girls, whatever it is, like lots of people have trouble in relationships. It's not just like a female thing. Right. Um, and so um, we help people through their relationships on the on the podcast. And you can learn so much about yourself by listening to those podcasts and saying, oh, maybe I do something like that. One hundred percent. And one of the and, and the, the getting tangible resources like Lori's podcast is powerful. Um, Lori's books is powerful because like you said, it, all it takes is one conversation to change your perspective, to be able to lead, lead a happier, healthier life. So I hope that this episode was another tool on the tool belt to help men and women lead happier and healthier life, to be able to be introspective, to be able to focus on the things that make you happy and not just the things that you desire temporarily. So Lori, for the people who want to reach out to you, where can they find you at? Um, they can uh, read my books. They can read Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. Uh, they can read Marry Him wherever they get books. They can listen to the Dear Therapist podcast wherever they listen to podcasts. They can watch my TED Talk, which is how changing your story can change your life. They can go to my website at lauriegottlieb.com and they can go to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter where they can find me as well. I love it. I love it. And one last closing word before we leave. So if there if there's a young lady who's 23 years old and, you know, she's like, well, that's not going to be me. That's her story. That's her experience. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she's somebody who may be in a pattern of unhealthy relationships and she's a person who was prioritizing the wrong things in a relationship. What is a closing message you'll give a young lady like that before you um, end today's conversation? I think it's not even for people who are in unhealthy relationships, but it's kind of like the book that I think every young person should read about what to look for in a partner and why. So it's the book that I think most of us wish that we had when we were in our 20s, but nobody ever gave it to us. And I think that every young person should read a book like this, where they, they have all the research there right in front of them of these are the things that matter. You can't see it right now, but these are the things you should be looking for. And when you date this way, you're going to find the person that you fall in love with much more quickly and you're going to find the right person. Sounds great. Lori, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. My name is Hafiz and I'm joined by Lori Gottlieb. We're the roommates and you guys have a great day. Thanks so much.